Um, thank you so much. It's great to be here at Big Ideas tonight. Um, after all, if we were in a university lecture hall, I'd probably have to issue some kind of trigger warning that the following content will offend old-style feminists, modern-day grievance warriors, and most certainly Julia Gillard. And if, we were, if I was, I was attending a, a conference of university students, I'd have to politely ask you not to applause at the end because it triggers anxiety, and if you could just please do this kind of weird jazz hand thing instead. So it's great to be here at Big Ideas. So what on earth is wrong with feminism today? Well, it's too early for karaoke, but feminism should really be summed up by Helen Reddy's iconic song, and you know the lyrics, I am woman, hear me roar, I am strong, I am invincible. Instead, though, the lyrics of modern feminism go something like this, I am woman, hear me whine, I am weak, I am vulnerable. Now, the notion of triage, of prioritising problems, of addressing those most in need has been inverted by modern-day feminism. And if today's feminists ran a hospital emergency department, they would surely be rushing to, to fix an otherwise healthy middle-aged woman with a common cold over a young girl facing a life-threatening injury. Now, don't get me wrong, because as Anne Mann said so eloquently many years ago, women like me inhaled the benefits of feminism as naturally as the air we breathe. But today the air is toxic. Today's modern feminism is a corruption of what feminism should be. It's become a trivial movement that infantilizes women and it's taken one heck of a moral detour away from real issues of freedom. But if feminism is not about freedom, what's the point of it? If it's, if it's not about freedom, really it's just a lobby group for pet grievances. And yet today's feminists feast on a smorgasbord of whinges and whines, of victimhood games and misogyny claims and gender binary discussions and Western world obsessions with the pay gap and quotas and glass ceilings. Brave writers of feminism's third wave include pop stars like Taylor Swift who said recently, I didn't see myself as held back until I was a woman. Well, as Heather Wilhelm wrote uh, recently in The Federalist, Held back from what, Taylor? Building a net worth of $250 million? Now, it's probably too much to expect modern celebrities to become feminist icons, but when women like Gwyneth Paltrow devote their time to the wonders of vaginal steaming and teaching us how to yawn properly, you really have to ask, is that the best they can do? So what about the media? How are they doing? How, and Rebecca, how long have I got? Let's start with uh, the keyboard feminists who found so much offence in Mark Latham's recent crude tweeting about a handful of women. And Latham last week gave up his column at the Australian Financial Review, and I'm not defending Latham. I mean, his gratuitous nastiness so often detracts from what can sometimes be a confronting kernel of truth. But it's uncanny how the sisterhood strikes when it suits, for political purposes and not as a matter of principle. So it's apparently fine for Fairfax's Clementine Ford to call Miranda Devine an effing C on Twitter, but it's not okay for Mark Latham to use equally crude language. Well, I say a pox on both of them. Now, some years ago, Ma um, Malcolm Turnbull rang me at home and he asked whether I had caught up with what Latham had said about me, and I hadn't caught up with what Latham had said. Latham had rose in our federal parliament and called me a skanky ho. Well, I didn't know what skanky ho meant, so while I was on the phone to Malcolm, I quickly Googled it, which was a mistake, because needless to say, I was inundated with more porn than is healthy when you're sitting at home surrounded by children. And I don't recall a single lefty feminist ticking off Mark Latham for calling me a smelly whore, as I discovered. And of course, that stunt came about because Latham was put up to um, saying those words for Hansard, dared by a lefty feminist, of course. There is an in-crowd of feminists, like the plastics in that iconic movie, The Mean Girls, the plastic feminists have their own set of rules. It's not about wearing pink on Wednesdays and tracky pants on Fridays. The feminist plastics have rigorous membership rules around believing in abortion, in quotas, in glass ceilings, and of course, assumed sexism. The feminist collective is overflowing with unprincipled trivia too. A couple of years ago, an English feminist in a London newspaper wrote this after reading something. She said, I washed my hands with antibacterial soap, but couldn't cleanse my mind from the rising rage and desolation. Or was she reading perhaps about female genital mutilation? Or maybe child marriages? No, of course she wasn't. The enraged feminist had just finished reading the fictional Fifty Shades of Grey. 
Now this poor commentator would probably have to take a vaginal steam bath if she listened to the words of Esther Perel recently giving a TED talk who made the point that most of us in fact get turned on at night by the very same things that we may demonstrate against during the day, that the erotic mind is not very politically correct. And I'll leave that subject to Cosmo magazine, save to say that feminism these days doesn't even understand the notion of freedom in the bedroom. So, and how are our politicians faring on the feminist front? Well, again, I'll go into overtime here. The horror exclaimed Green Senator Larissa Waters last year. Was she responding to Islamic State's propaganda, perhaps, which says that it's permissible to buy, sell, or give as a gift female captives and slaves, so they are merely property? It says it's permissible to have intercourse with a female slave who hasn't reached puberty. Now, of course she wasn't. The Green Senator was emoting over the fact that a Liberal MP, Michaelia Cash, refuses to wear the feminist label. Feminism has been corrupted by its skewed set of priorities. You'll remember that um, when her leadership was in trouble, Australia's first female Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, made asinine claims of sexism and misogyny against then opposition leader, Tony Abbott. And to coin a phrase from Helen Garner's wonderfully nuanced look at sex and power, Gillard had a grid labelled misogyny and she was determined to apply it to the broadest possible field of male behaviour. So when Abbott glanced at his watch in Parliament, that too was labelled sexism. And yet that speech became such a defining moment for so many modern day uh, feminists. On the same afternoon that Gillard gave that speech, a young Pakistani girl, Malala Yousafzai, boarded her school bus in the northwest Pakistani district of Swat, an area where the local Taliban has regularly banned girls from attending school. A gunman boarded that bus too, and he asked for Malala by name, and he fired three shots. One hit her directly on the left side of her head, travelling through her face and lodging into her shoulder. Now imagine, just imagine for a moment, if Julia Gillard had rose on that October day in 2012 and given a speech about Malala rather than herself. Now don't get me wrong, because of course we can walk and chew gum. But we are so gummed up with the Western grievances such as sexism and pay gaps that we, try to, we fail to try to even walk in the shoes of young girls who need to escape from child marriages or women who are the subject or the victim of um, honour-based, so-called honour-based violence. Feminism has been corrupted by its cultural infirmity too, by a deep anti-Western self-loathing. Remember, while hostages were still being held at gunpoint by a terrorist in the Lint Cafe here in Sydney last November, or last December, many high-profile Australian women joined to rush a feel-good hashtag campaign, Wish, Women in Solidarity for Hijabs. Now, putting aside the fact that these women immediately assumed that Australians would default to evil Islamophobia, why didn't they show more concern for the hostages inside that cafe? Or even have a more nuanced discussion around the fact that millions of women are forced to wear the veil as a medieval form of oppression. Hashtag campaigns, pay gaps, quotas, trigger warnings, men looking at watches. I mean, these don't even make the list of my top ten issues about freedom, uh, about um, the lack of freedom facing women today. Fem feminism's focus on the trifling, petty grievances debases our public conversations. But more importantly, it undermines the intellectual scaffolding around freedom. The corruption of feminism is not a women's issue. It's best understood, I think, as sympt symptomatic of a wider and much deeper malaise because it emerges from a decades-long corruption of human rights. And once the notion of human rights became untethered from classical liberal ideals, Feminism, of course, went the same way. It's no coincidence, for example, that the corruption of feminism has occurred at the same time as our commitment to free speech has faltered. The very notion of free speech doesn't seem to cut it anymore. Now we talk about fair speech and words that don't offend or insult people. Forty years ago, the left abandoned libertarian notions of human rights and embraced this new definition of egalitarian rights. And as our Attorney General George Brandis has pointed out, that shift began with the elevation of this so-called right to equal concern and respect. Well, equal concern and respect, what on earth does that mean? And yet here was the beginning of a recalibrated human rights movement in favour of victimhood as defined by the paternalistic left. Feelings have now become the measurement of human rights. 
And this new victimhood movement has ditched enlightenment ideals as Brendan alluded to, around the very notion of what it means to be a human being. No longer are people seen as autonomous and resilient, as rational human beings. Under this new framework, people are seen as weak, as vulnerable, as quivering masses of nerves in need of protection. So much so that we're, we need trigger warnings and jazz hands and laws against words that offend and insult us. The marketplace of ideas, that place where we critique and analyse and strengthen the very best of ideas, is being usurped by a marketplace of outrage, where human rights legislation and anti-discrimination bureaucracies buttress this new victimhood movement. So two viruses, victimhood politics and this persistent strain of anti-Westernism, have corroded our most basic freedoms. And these viruses have weakened our very ability to, to defend our most basic values. Fundamental human rights, such as the right to freedom of expression, are now being offered to minorities at discounted prices. F hence, free speech is now fair speech. And our cultural appeasement carries costs, because it means that in Australia, we have a conservative government, for example, that claims to have free speech in its DNA, and yet refuses to reform the Racial Discrimination Act. Cultural appeasement has horrendous physical costs too because it means 4,000 cases of female genital mutilation in Britain alone last year, and they're just the reported ones. So there should be no reduction, no discount, no, no half price sale for our most fundamental human rights. And that means no silence around the importance of these values. A few months ago, the Swedish Foreign Minister Margot Wallström delivered what was a scathing assessment of the treatment of women in Saudi Arabia. And remember there, women can't drive, they can't marry, and they can't have certain medical procedures without permission from men. So what happened? Well, what I call the oppression opera returned to town, that familiar chorus of bleating about Islamophobia that we've seen so often ever since Salman Rushdie wrote a book called Satanic Verses. The Arab world condemned the Swedish foreign minister for Islamophobia and Saudi Arabia withdrew its ambassador to Sweden. I guess at least there wasn't a fatwa this time. But what happened outside the Arab world was even more disappointing and yet so predictable because Wallström's defence of women's freedom was greeted with silence in the West. As Nick Cohen wrote in The Spectator, outside Sweden, the Western media barely covered this story. The scandal is that there isn't a scandal. The scandal is the strategic silence of modern feminism around freedom for women. How much easier it is to attack a pay gap or a so-called pay gap than female genital mutilation or so-called honour killings, which logically might just require you to make judgments about cultures that oppress women. Feminism's warriors, both male and female, have become the natural allies, or useful idiots, if you like, of those opposed to Western freedoms. The real feminists, those fighting for women's freedom, don't sit at the, feminism, at the centre of feminism today. So how the hell do we get feminism back on the freedom track? Well, the future of feminism is inextricably linked with the future of human rights. And when the latter rediscovers classical notions of liberty, so too will feminism. And as Abraham Lincoln said so eloquently and so succinctly in 1863, liberty is unfinished work. And again, to quote... Lincoln, he implored us to take increased devotion to this cause. And by doing that, let me suggest that feminism might just one day return to the unfinished work of freedom. And when it does, more women and more when will start applauding it and not with any kind of weird jazz hands. Thank you. <laughs>